Uh, thanks to all, all of you for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank Dunya for putting this event together. Thank uh, Rajiv in particular. Um, this, is a, this is a book that we wrote that's mostly focused on the Great Recession in the United States and in Europe to some degree. And rather than talking you through the arguments of the book, uh, I want you to actually read the book. So I'm not going to go, go through the book in detail. I'm going to take the lessons from the book and try to apply them to the current global economic outlook. And in particular, I'm going to focus on some of the major trends that I see in the global economy and how they are related to some of the major themes that we discuss in the book. OK? So um, if you could advance the slide. So and advance it again. You'll need to click it a few times. Actually, you can just click all through the, the whole slide. So. Um, I think where I want to start is with a conundrum that we've had uh, among economic forecasters. And that is economic forecasters have consistently been too optimistic. And I was thinking to myself, uh, looking at the video material, uh, that it shows such optimism, which I'm very grateful for. I have a little bit more of a pessimistic message, uh, but hopefully it will end with optimism because I think we have some solutions that can potentially get us out of some of the problems that we're in. What I'm showing you up here on the slide is the World Bank's economic forecast for GDP growth in 2015. Okay, and I'm showing you what they're forecasting for growth in world GDP in 2012, 13, 14, and 15. Okay, so that is the World Bank makes a forecast three years in advance of what global GDP growth is going to be three years from now. So in 2012, basically they're saying, look, 2015 world GDP growth is going to be about 3.3%. In 2013, they actually revised it upwards. They actually, GDP growth is going to be doing, doing even better. Then all of a sudden in 2014, you start seeing, which has been a consistent pattern in economic forecasting over the last five or six years, is a downward revision. They used to say, okay, actually, the world economy is not doing as well as we thought, and growth in 2015 is only going to be uh, 3%. And then, of course, in 2015, which is basically a real-time forecast, because now they're giving the forecast for the years we're actually in, they lower it all the way down to 2.4%. Okay? If you can click through the slides a few more times. Yeah, right there. Um, here is the 2016 world GDP forecast. And you see the same message, that over time, economic forecasters have consistently been too optimistic about how well the economy is going to perform worldwide. Okay? I'm not picking on the World Bank here. The same thing would be true of the IMF. The same thing would be true of the Fed if you focused on the US. The same thing would be true of the ECB if you focused on Europe. Economic forecasters have consistently been too optimistic about the world economy over the last five or six years. This is going all the way back to 2009, in which many people said, oh, the advanced economies of the world are going to have a V-shaped recovery, very strong recovery. So what the book is about is why is it the case that the Great Recession was so severe? And I think the lessons from the book are very similar for thinking about the following question, and that is, why does the world economy seem to be having such a hard time generating sustainable, long-run, strong growth. Okay, this is both in emerging economies and in uh, the U.S. economy. And when it comes down to it, I think uh, the cartoon on the next slide, if you could advance the slide for me, please. Can you advance the slide, please? Um, this is a play on a Little Red Riding Hood uh, uh, a fairy tale that we tell in the U.S., in which the Little Red Riding Hood is telling to her grandma going through her books, my grandma, what crushing debt you have. And you know, those of you who know the Little Red Riding Hood story, it's usually a wolf that has eaten the grandma at this point. It's what, what big teeth you have, what big ears you have, and then, of course, Little Red Riding Hood meets her demise when the big bad wolf actually eats her. In this story, of course, it seems like grandma has somehow probably taken a cash-out refinancing on her mortgage, bought a security system, and is therefore able to prevent the big bad wolf from getting out, but, of course, is then left with a lot of debt. And that's really the central message of our book, and that is very severe recessions typically follow situations in which household debt rise dramat rises dramatically in a country. Okay? 
If you want to think about the usual suspects from the Great Recession, they would be the United States, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Spain, Greece. Name a country that you think had a really terrible recession in 2008, 2009, and 2010. And I can tell you with almost assurance that they had a big housing boom that fueled household debt preceding it. Okay? In fact, the recent research we've been doing shows that this phenomenon is true not just in the United States or the advanced economy, but throughout the world. And in fact, if you can advance to the next slide, this picture is a little bit technical, but very important, so let me walk you through it. In this picture, we're looking at the overall rise in the household debt to GDP ratio for the entire world, or at least the 40 or so countries we have in our sample. That's what I'm plotting for you on the vertical axis. It is the expansion in household debt to GDP ratio worldwide from four years ago to last year. Okay? You can see the usual suspects over here on the far right, 07, 06, 08. These are years in which we know global household debt rose very dramatically. On the vertical axis is subsequent GDP growth for the world economy from this year to three years later. Okay? So standing in 2008, what I'm saying is household debt expansion from 2005 to 2008 is going to predict much lower world GDP growth from 2008 to 2011. Our recent research shows that country by country, this is one of the strongest predictive factors you can have for a, an economic downturn in a country. Okay? A rapid ex, uh, explosion in household debt, usually associated with a housing boom, is the sure way you get an economic recession in a country. Okay? And obviously we made these arguments in 2010 and 2011. If I wasn't an academic and was a more bold trader, like many of you may have had that experience in your life, I could have made a lot of money forecasting out of sample. Okay? In 2011, you could immediately start seeing the foundations of very severe economic downturns in many emerging economies. Okay? The usual suspects in emerging economies would be Brazil, Thailand, and China to a lesser degree. China is a little bit more than just household debt. It's obviously also non-financial corporate debt and a big bank leverage boom. In fact, if you can go to the next slide, um, in this picture what I'm showing you is just how robust this relationship is. So the exact same story that played out from 2000 to 2007 in advanced economies is now playing out in emerging economies. So here I'm plotting for you the household debt to income change from 2007 to 2014 on the horizontal axis. Okay? And what do you see? You see Thailand out there, you see Brazil, you see China. And now on the vertical axis, I obviously don't have what, how bad it's going to be, so I'm going to use the forecast revision by the World Bank. So the World Bank every year revises its forecast for future growth, and you can see that the countries that experience the largest increase in debt are seeing the largest downward revision in their future growth. Okay? And again, I think the countries that really stick out here are Thailand, Brazil, and China. And in fact, China, in my opinion, should be actually further down because I think the GDP numbers coming out of China are just not reliable. I think they're already going, undergoing a much more serious correction than the data are revealing. And I think, you know, I don't want to be the ultimate pessimist here, but if you look at history, you look at Charles Kindleberger, the great economist at MIT, wrote a book called, you know, Manias and Crashes. China is basically has followed exactly the recipe that has traditionally led to economic disaster. Okay? Huge increases in debt to finance durables. I always call it the two Ds are the most dangerous thing. When you have debt and durables that explode all of a sudden in a short time period, that usually forecasts very bad things. This isn't just true of the emerging economies today or even the advanced economies from 2000 to 2007. This is also true actually in the Great Depression. They called them the Roaring Twenties for a reason. People were taking a lot of debt on in the 1920s in the United States. They weren't buying so many homes then. They were buying automobiles. They were buying sewing machines. And again, you saw the most severe recession in our century, in the 20th century, in the United States was again preceded by a big increase in household debt. So this is the cycle that's currently being played out. It was playing out in the advanced economies from 2000 to 2007, and then it was basically, it's being played out now in a lot of emerging economies. And I think one of the countries that I do like to focus on because it contrasts different stories is Brazil. 
Brazil, many people think it's about a commodities boom, maybe it's about political mismanagement. Of course, those things are very important. But in Brazil, in 2000, in the last two months of 2015, in November and December, you saw the largest increase in the trade surplus of the country in the last five or 10 years, okay? An increase in the trade surplus in Brazil goes exactly against the commodity type story in which they're having trouble exporting because commodity prices have fallen. Instead, the increase in the trade surplus is consistent with the idea, which is what you've seen in Brazil, that you're seeing a massive cutback in the consumption of import goods, in particular durable goods such as automobiles, refrigerators, and household goods. Brazil underwent, underwent a massive expansion of auto debt and consumer loans from 2007 to 2014, and that's why we're seeing basically a very bad recession there today. So fundamentally, what's the cause? What's going on? I want to be very clear, especially in a room of, of bankers. I'm not saying all household debt is evil, that we should always just not lend to households. What seems to be the case in our research is it's these sharp increases over a two to three to four year period that seem completely unrelated to productivity shocks or, or better job opportunities. It is what I would call credit supply shocks. Banks begin to lend more to households, in particular, marginal households who may not have good credit histories when there is no justification based on the income of those borrowers. This is exactly what happened in the subprime lending boom in the US. It's obviously happening to some degree in the subprime auto lending right now in the US. Anytime you see a rapid expansion in debt to what I would call more marginal households, that's not justified by better income opportunities or better productivity incomes, those typically end very badly. So why do they happen? Why do we see these global economic cycles um, occur in which debt massively expands? Well, I won't blame all bankers, as Rajiv will say. I think the research has increasingly shown that monetary policy of the core countries is a key factor. Okay? That is, when the Federal Reserve, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, um, and the Bank of England, when they tend to run very loose monetary policy, you tend to see a lot of credit going toward households, and in particular households that may not have the best credit histories, that may not be able to repay those loans. And I think that's very much what you're seeing happening in emerging economies. Uh, my colleague, and now who's obviously the governor of the Bank of India, uh, Raghu Rajan has pointed this out uh, to a large degree, that there is this phenomenon, kind of the search for yield phenomenon, that leads to lending to more marginal households, marginal credit-worthy borrowers, and I can tell you based on the data that that typically ends badly. And I think we're seeing that play out in many advanced economies today. Or, sorry, in many emerging economies today. So I don't want to be all pessimistic. I think when we're thinking about the current global circumstance, one of the nice things globally is that if you actually average everything out, the world has actually undergone a pretty massive deleveraging over the last three or four years. Because as the emerging economies have leveraged up, Many of the advanced economies, and in particular the U.S., have actually dramatically reduced their debt burden. And that's why I think the U.S. is actually doing quite well. And if, if anything, I am actually quite optimistic about the United States. And so I don't think it's all negative news. But I think one of the things I want to encourage people to think about is just why are these credit cycles happening? What is the deeper issue? How is it related to monetary policy in the core countries? One of the main proposals we give in the book for trying to break free from these debt cycles is to have more innovation on the types of financial contracts that we use. And in particular, in the current regulatory environment, it might be very difficult, but one of the products that we advocate are what we call equity risk mortgages or shared responsibility mortgages in which a bank would provide a mortgage. It doesn't have to be a bank, actually. The more interest comes from private equity investors and in particular hedge funds in which you basically make a capital gain if the house price goes up and the individual sells the house at a gain. But likewise, if house prices in your neighborhood fall, the principal balance on the mortgage contract would automatically adjust downward. We argue that such equity-based mortgages would have better risk-sharing properties. They would lead to less severe bubbles. They would less to lead to less severe uh, economic downturns. And they overall actually have a lot of interest in the private sector. And one of the most interesting things is We've gotten a lot of calls, actually, from people in the private sector very interested in this product, and in particular from private equity and hedge fund investors who, at the end of the day, want a piece of the upside of real estate booms, which mortgages just don't give you. And so you can potentially see that as an innovative project. 
product that could potentially be implemented. So I don't want to take up too much time. I know we're going to have a lot of questions and answers, and hopefully uh, we can continue the discussion. But the bottom line is that looking forward, if you want to think carefully about how any given economy is going to be performing over the next few years, a sure variable that you should be looking at is how the evolution of household debt burdens has expanded in the country. Slow, gradual increases in household debt are actually a sign of positive financial development. Over, over, over the long run, we think more debt, more equity intermediation is good for a country. But these sharp increases in debt that usually occur because of credit supply shocks, where banks become more willing to lend, oftentimes being pushed by lower interest rates from a central bank, those typically end badly, and that's something you should look out for whenever you're investing in any given country. So let me conclude there, and I'm happy to take questions and, and have a question and answer period. Thanks very much. We're Dunia. We do things differently.